Do you have a scary story you want to send my way? Go to AsTheRavenDreams.com slash submit or click one of them links down below. Thank you. I just wanted to share one of the traumatizing things that happened to me when I was skipping high school when I shouldn't have been. I was taking a grade 12 physics class over the summer to get ahead of my year, since I was in grade 11 at the time. However, the teacher ended up sucking and I decided to drop it and just take it with my actual year. It was a Friday. My dad dropped me off at the school and left for work. I walked into the main office and asked to be removed from the class, which they did. It was 9am, and I realized my dad wouldn't be picking me up until 1pm. But, I remembered there was a strip mall right across the road from the school, so I decided to kill some time there. This mall opened at 9am as well, so when I was walking into the area, the parking was essentially empty, except for the workers' cars. It was a very quiet and gloomy morning, not a person in sight outside. I saw a drug mart and decided to check out some makeup or something there. While I was walking, I was busy looking for music on my iPod and I slowed down. I noticed it seemed to be too quiet. I didn't care to look around then, but when I started walking again, the quiet was gone. And that's when I saw it. A red car driving just steps behind me, as slow as ever. When I walked, it drove slowly and silently behind me. When I stopped, it stopped. When I saw the car doing this, the man inside must have freaked out a little bit as he revealed himself. Come here, where are you going? Let me give you a ride. I ignored it. He wouldn't stop. Five to six times the same question and... Now he was driving right alongside me. I ran for the drug mart's door. Finally, I thought, safe inside the store. I went to the makeup section and started looking at lipstick. Literally, out of nowhere, a voice. I can buy that for you. He'd followed me inside the store. This time I got a good look at him. An African American man wearing blue jeans a bright yellow, almost neon shirt, probably 30 to 40 years old. No, thank you, I can get it myself. The timid, socially anxious high schooler in me was freaking out. Sweaty palms, heart beating fast. I couldn't believe he had the nerve to follow me in there. Ah, uh, come on baby, I can get it. No, thank you, I have money. Pick anything you want. I'll buy it for you. I'm sorry, I don't know you. So what? Let me treat you, baby. Scared out of my mind, I changed aisles. I didn't know where else to go. All I knew is that I couldn't walk out of the store, he would just follow me again. And then there would be no one there to see me. He came after me. Where are you going? School? I lied. Surely he'd back off knowing I was underage. He didn't. What school? Let me drive you. Pretty girls don't walk. I don't know you. Well, you can get to know me. This is how people make friends. I already have friends. Not any like me. He grinned. My stomach fell to the floor. Sorry, I said, walking away as he followed again. How old are you? Sixteen? I was seventeen, but I wanted to emphasize that I was young. Oh, you're so pretty like a doll. This triggered me. He really didn't care. Please, leave me alone. I don't talk to strangers. I was teary-eyed at this point. Oh, come with me. We can be friends. At this point, a miracle. An employee walked up to us. Excuse me, do you know this man? No, I said, choking back tears. As I said no, the pervert said yes. I didn't ask you. 
She answered to him. Is he bothering you? She asked me. Yes, I replied, half relieved, half traumatized. Leave the store right now or I'm calling security, she said to him. But I didn't even do anything, he protested, yet still hurriedly left the store. After that, things are kind of a blur. The employee told me that she had heard the discomfort in my tone while talking to the man the next aisle over. I was crying and thanking her. Next, she did call security because she said it was part of her job, and was also being cautious in case the man was waiting for me to leave the store and come outside. Security came, and they asked me a couple of questions. He started with asking for a physical description of the man. Then he went on to inquire about how the events unfolded, what he had asked me, and if I felt that he was a threat. I said that I felt like he was a threat, and a report was filed. A security guard wanted to call my parents as he could see that I was upset, but I requested that he not do so. This was because I had school that day and my dad knew nothing about me dropping the class, so I was scared. Looking back on it now, I wish that I had called him. The security, the employees, as well as the store manager took action right away. They did not let me leave the store until an hour later, and even then an employee waited with me outside for my dad to pick me up, in case the man was waiting for me hidden somewhere. There was a walk-in medical clinic next door, who also received a warning to look out for a black man in a yellow shirt. This warning was extended to the rest of the area as well. Everyone was on high alert. And everyone was thinking just one thing. Was this an assault? A kidnapping? God forbid, a murder just waiting to take place? This happened almost ten years ago, but for some reason... I was never able to forget it. It makes me scared for when I have kids. What if I'd been all alone? What if my kids are ever alone? And that day, I learned two valuable lessons. Number one, ask for help when you need it, because things get really bad. And number two, stay in school, kids. Stay safe, everyone. I've been looking for a place to share this story, and maybe get some outside perspective on it. I started by googling Reddit strange experiences, which led me here. When I was about six years old, in kindergarten or first grade, I can't remember which, we lived across the street from my school. I mean right across the street. From our front room window, the school property was the majority of what could be seen. I went to this school until my second grade year, when the school was shut down by the district. Most kids were shipped off to whatever school happened to be closest to them, and the abandoned property became a community center of sorts for the town of less than 200 or so people. I won't drop the name of the town, but I will say that it is somewhere in rural Illinois, that the estimated 200-person figure was in 1989, and that there are considerably fewer people there now, as most of the population has either moved away or died, and several of the houses have burned down. Today, the town is even more dried up than it was during my kindergarten years, and the last time I visited, it looked as though nature was beginning the process of reclaiming it. I say all of this because it's important that you understand how small this town was slash is. People didn't randomly show up there. Strangers would be immediately recognized. There was nowhere for them to hide because the town really only had three streets. All but the end of one of them let out of town and the lone end of the lone street that didn't offer escape route led to a dead end with an ancient old cemetery. Another escape route, in a manner of speaking. 
This town had nothing but a post office, a couple of abandoned buildings that I'm fairly certain used to be general stores back in the distant, distant past, and a payphone. Today, the post office is shut down, and the payphone is gone, so keep all of this in mind when I say that a stranger or creep would have been noticed immediately. It's surprising then that I was almost abducted by a stranger in that town. From directly in front of the school. Actually, I think I was abducted. That's the weird thing. When I left the school that day, the man was standing in front of his vehicle and he greeted me by name. And that's what makes this even stranger. The man knew my name. He told me that my mom had sent him to pick me up for some reason or another, though the memory of what he actually said is a bit hazy. It amounts to, your mom isn't home. She sent me to pick you up and take you where she is. Get in, we'll go for a ride. You know, the usual creeper thing. And I did. There are certain details I don't remember from this point. Why didn't I just look across the street to see if my mom's car was sitting in our driveway? Maybe I did. Where did we go? I don't know. What happened? I don't know. I have the briefest of memories of me sitting in the passenger seat of his vehicle, saying something as we drove out of town. I can't remember what he said. I can't remember what he looked like. I can't remember why my next memory is of us back in my driveway in the house across from the school. There's just a, a large chunk of my memory gone. I don't know if there's something that I've blocked out for the last 33 years. Maybe he took me somewhere and did something to me that creeps do to young and trusting little boys. And I just locked it up inside. I hope not. I hope he was some aspiring kidnapper with a conscience who just couldn't accept the enormity of the heinous sin he was about to commit and took me back home. That nothing had happened to me, that my lack of memory is due more to the entire sequence of events being so uneventful that my developing little brain felt no need to keep it in storage. I've often wondered if there's some way, like through some form of therapeutic hypnosis they show in movies and on TV, to unlock these memories. Or if that's even a real thing. Or, if it is, if I even really want to venture down that rabbit hole and discover what really happened. Maybe some things should just remain buried. I'm sure you've heard that expression. Don't ask questions you don't want the answers to. Yeah, I feel that applies here. And maybe someone will tell me it was just a vivid dream that a young child had, and remembered incorrectly as an actual memory. This is not the case. A few years back, I actually asked my mom about it. Do you remember when that strange man took me from the school and brought me back? Oh, yeah. Apparently, I told her what happened, because she told me about how she went over to the school and raised a bunch of hell over it. And that's all I have to prove, even to myself, that it ever even happened. Up until then, I had wondered if I had imagined the whole thing. This is, unfortunately, no longer something I can even attempt to convince myself is true. Who was this man? Why did he take me? Why did he bring me back? And what happened that day? I'm a big fan of horror. I love a novel or a movie about monsters. I'm an avid fan of Stephen King and Creepypasta. But it isn't Pennywise the Dancing Clown or Slenderman that keeps me up at night sometimes. No. It's the real monster who almost gobbled me up when I was six years old, and then lost his appetite. Thanks for listening. A quick update. For those of you asking if this was possibly my dad, I just called him and I asked him. His response? He said, If it had been me, I wouldn't have taken you back. I would have kept driving and you would have gone to name of state with me. That may sound like a joke, but... It wasn't. So, so much for that theory. I went to college in a historic, 
mid-sized city in Florida. And at the time, I lived in a duplex downtown, maybe three blocks from campus. The city is known to be pretty safe, and I lived in a pretty decent area with large, historic homes near me. This all happened about three years ago. A little backstory that will become relevant. The duplex I lived in had a front door that locked, and then both the upstairs and downstairs units had their own locking door. I lived downstairs and had two roommates, but in this specific night, only one of my roommates was home. We knew the girl that lived upstairs, but only really spoke to them in passing. When they moved in, we emphasized how important it was for us for them to keep the main front door locked, and they did a good job of doing so. So, me and my roommates are in for the night, knowing the front door is locked, and smoke a few joints. At some point, we hear a knock on the front door, and quickly realize the girls upstairs had ordered a pizza. Later on, it becomes evident that they never locked the front door after receiving their pizza. We finally go to sleep in our own rooms, and since I had a queen bed, I would often sleep with my phone and laptop next to me in my bed. A couple of hours after I fell asleep, I woke up to a man standing over my bed. As soon as I realized I'm not dreaming, I noticed that he is quickly moving my phone and computer off of my bed and moving my comforter, trying to get into my bed. I start to ask him who he is, what he's doing there, and I'm just generally confused, as I was still slightly high from before I went to sleep. The only thing he said to me, multiple times, was that he was just trying to get in bed. At this point, I began to panic, as my mind obviously goes to the worst. I was hoping that maybe my roommate had invited some random Tinder guy over and that he had gone into the wrong room, but the more I questioned him, all he had to say was, I'm just trying to get in bed. I own pepper spray and a stun gun, but I accidentally left them on a shelf that the guy was standing in front of so there was no way I would be able to grab them without escalating the situation. Realizing I needed to do something quickly, I blurted, There are five people who live in this house, and if you don't get the hell out now, I will scream and they will all be here within seconds. Luckily, that was all it took to scare him off. I don't know if he had brought something with him, or if he'd stolen something from me, but I saw him grab something in the dark and run out of my room. As soon as he left the room, I shut the door and locked it and tried to find my phone. I couldn't find it anywhere, but then quickly realized that between my room and the front door is the room of my friend that was home. As scared as I was, I was terrified that the guy had maybe gone into her room. I grabbed my stun gun and a pocket knife counted to three and ripped my door open. I ran into my roommate's room and she was fast asleep, and there was no evidence of the guy. I told her what happened, and she asked me if I was sure that I wasn't dreaming. I began to question myself until I walked out of her room and saw that our front door was wide open. I went to my room to search for my phone and finally find it hidden under a pile of clothes across the room from where I had left it. That sent a chill up my spine, as I immediately knew for a fact someone had been in my house and my room while I was sleeping, and long enough to hide my phone, which only worsened my suspicions of his intentions. I ran back to my roommate's room, who at that point believed me, we barricaded ourselves in the room and called 911. Within minutes, there were police cars swarming our street and yard, and they yelled for us quickly to leave the residence and run towards them. At least a dozen police officers came running in, and they searched every inch of our apartment, and they woke up the girls upstairs. Then they searched their apartment as well to ensure that the man had left. 
The officers then had me write a statement. I gave them a description of the man. And to this day, I've never heard a single thing about the case. I feel incredibly lucky with the outcome of this situation, but the thought of his intentions terrifies me. And additionally, the fact that he was never caught scares me, as I would hate for anyone to have to go through the pure fear that I did. I will add, there is a chance that he was on drugs or mentally ill, and had no bad intentions. However, because he was never caught, I will never know, and my mind will always assume the worst. For just a little context, I'm a female college student who's recently moved into a house with a roommate. The house doesn't come with a washer dryer, although we can rent one from the housing office. My roommate thought it would save money if we just went to a laundromat instead of like paying $35 per month. But after tonight, I'm going to be insistent that we get one. I think that's just the basics that you will need for the story. Last night, around 10pm, something happened that I needed to do an emergency wash. I live in a college town, and near the campus there are a couple of laundromats, so I drove to one of those. I'm not sure why I chose this one, but I went based off of memory and just ended up going to the one laundromat that's literally right off the campus. You could walk a short distance and technically be on campus. While I was washing my clothes, a friend snapchatted me and I saw that she was walking her dog on campus. I loaded up everything that wasn't in the washer and I went to go see her. She ended up being with another friend and we all ended up hanging out. After leaving Betty and Tiffany, who I noticed didn't go straight home, I went back to the laundromat to switch my stuff over. It was going to be another 36 minutes and I just decided to wait out there. And probably about five minutes in, my senses, like, prickled up, you know? Like that feeling that someone else is in the room, even though you can't see them. Yeah, that. And then, lo and behold, a man walks through the back a few seconds later. The way the building is set up, there's a parking lot and a front room, where there are some washers and small dryers, and a small doorway that leads to more washers and bigger dryers. I decided to set up in the back in hopes of finding a big washer to do just one load, but ended up doing two washing loads. Now, I'm kind of used to guys hitting on me, read cat calling, truthfully, and so when this guy, let's call him Blue Shirt, did it, I wasn't caught off guard. It doesn't happen often, but it happens enough. So I do my usual routine of lying about myself and stuff like that. Unfortunately, Blue Shirt was persistent, and so I had texted Betty to call me. So I'm using the phone call as an excuse not to talk to him, although that didn't stop him from trying. And while I'm on the phone, I'm trying to signal Betty to come to the laundromat. I was able to finally get outside under the impression of getting my laundry basket, and I straight up tell Betty to come there. She and Tiffany weren't too far from me, and they came right away. The entire time I was on the phone with that, I stopped looking at Blue Shirt. I would pass by him occasionally, being that he was standing in the doorway that connects the back room and the front room. However, I wouldn't even look at him. I would politely say excuse me, but wouldn't acknowledge him in any other way. Betty and Tiffany finally showed up, but unfortunately, I still had 18 minutes left on the dryer. So we all just gathered around the dryer waiting, and went back and forth between inside and outside. I updated them on everything going on while we were outside, and when the timer got to 10 minutes, we stayed by the dryer. 
While Tiffany and I had our backs to him, I didn't even want to see him. Betty was watching him. She later said that he was just looking at us and listening and talking on his phone. Finally, my clothes dried, and while I was getting my stuff, I had casually mentioned how I'm glad I lived near my friends so we would all be going the same way. This was a lie. We literally lived on opposite ends of town, but I didn't want to go home and have Blue Shirt follow me. Pretty soon, the three of us left and got in our car, and while we were leaving, Blue Shirt had followed us outside to his car. I was going to follow my friends back to their house, and as we back out of the laundromat, we were at a corner where Blue Shirt was adjacent to us in his car. Betty refused to let Tiffany go until he had made a left turn, going in the opposite direction of us. We ended up going in crazy directions to their house, until Betty had us pull over just to make sure nothing was attached to the car, and thank god nothing was. I stayed at their place last night, and was very thankful that they came for me. Betty just kept saying she was so glad that I called them. I really just wanted to get this off my chest without feeling guilty, so thank you for listening. This is the scariest thing that's happened to me so far. When I went outside the first time after Blue Shirt showed up, I could not find a car. I later learned that he had parked on the side of the building. Something else that I had realized that made me think I wasn't being paranoid is that the whole time he was there, Blue Shirt didn't do a single load of laundry, nor touch any clothes. I'm just gonna get this out of the way. English is not my first language. This is 100% true. At the end, I'll even give some names so you can look up the news articles. So, a little bit about me. I'm a super tiny Asian woman. I immigrated to Canada at 13, and I stand at a height of 4'8", and weigh a whopping 80 pounds. So, I'm super tiny. Most of this takes place in high school. I only spent two years until I was 16 in high school, as I fast-tracked and went to university early. To say I was and am a huge nerd is an understatement. Back then, I spent all of my free time in the library playing Magic the Gathering or Pokemon with my friends. Well, unfortunately for me, there was this guy who was semi-introduced to the group named David. David was this unkempt, dirty guy. Yeah, he was in decent shape, but, you know, the dirtiness really took away from that. David had his fair share of issues, emotional problems, mostly. He was always angry, throwing stuff, getting into fights, and was, in general, a pervert. I did not like David. Unfortunately for me, David really took a liking to me. He always tried to get close to me, touch me, say disgusting things to me. Well... David decided that I was his, that he owned me, and that I was his girlfriend. At the time, my English was terrible, plus I was still this super shy girl, and I did my best to say no, and I avoided him as much as humanly possible. It all came to an end toward my last few months in high school. My friends and I were doing our usual thing, playing games in the library, and in walks David with his friends and he points at me. He was like, Her, right there. She's my girlfriend. Yeah, she's my bitch. At this point, I'd had enough, and I just said, No, I don't like you. No, I'm not dating you, and no, I will never date you. I think you are disgusting. Well, David didn't like that and said, Huh, she's just playing. Watch this. He then quickly reached out and grabbed my breast. On a good day, I don't like to be touched, and, well, this was not a good day. I lost my shit and started slapping and screaming, 
slapping and screaming and crying and slapping. I ended up getting a day's suspension from school and almost expelled, but lucky for me, my friends defended me. So yeah, that's my part of the story, and now for the scary part. January 1st, 2008, in the morning around breakfast time, a girl was stabbed to death outside of her house. This was the first murder of 2008 in Toronto. It was David. So, I'm haunted by the thought that it could have been me lying in a pool of my own blood, stabbed to death by David. If you want, you can look up the name David Bagshaw. I feel so sorry for the girl that he killed, but I am thankful that I was spared. I wish none of this was true, but it unfortunately is. Once, I went to close the curtains as I was heading to sleep. I approached the window and I saw a face staring back at me. It looked at me. It looked surprised and suddenly ducked. We've always had two large dogs at our house that bark at anything that ever approaches the house. They hadn't made a noise. I went outside and found nothing. I told my parents and they just laughed at me. They said it was my reflection. I don't think my reflection would have made movements that I didn't make. I texted my friend about it and he told me it was probably a pedophile which creeped me out even more. If it were a person, the dogs definitely would have sniffed them out. There's no way they could have gone through the fence without the dogs noticing. If it was something paranormal, it also seems strange since there have also been no other odd instances where my dogs seemed to detect anything otherworldly going on. I never found out what I saw, but it definitely was not my reflection. My dogs were never very friendly with strangers, unless we were with them. Around the time this happened, a neighbor was bitten by one of our dogs. We live in a rural area, and this particular neighbor was the closest one, and he lives about a quarter mile from our house. This happened while my dad was out of town all week for work. This had been the case for a few months now. I was around 15 at the time. We only found out he was bitten because he came to tell us that our dog had bit him, and that he was going to call the police so they could put the dog down. For context, he was apparently taking a walk at 10pm. We decided to call his bluff about calling the police as we thought it was very suspicious that he was out walking this late, also potentially being drunk. He got spooked. About a week later, he decided to come back to threaten us about getting our dog put down, but once again, he was drunk, and we were able to call his bluff. So, part of me thinks the face I saw could have been his, but I still can't figure out how he would have been able to get past the fence without my dogs noticing. Someone suggested that perhaps he was giving my dogs treats or something to get them to like him, but if that were true, I would think the other incident wouldn't have happened. So that was a collection of six terrifying encounter stories. Hopefully you all enjoyed them to the best of your ability. Obviously, they're pretty creepy. Um, huge thank you to everyone who lets me use these stories. As I've always said, these kinds of videos, they hold both an entertainment and education value in that if somebody listens to these and sees the possibilities, hopefully they can potentially see their way out of a situation that's similar um, or avoid a situation that's similar altogether. So, again, a huge, huge thank you to everyone who lets me read their stories, especially these. And, of course, a huge thank you to everyone who listens to my videos or watches my videos, whichever one you do. And, yeah, I want to say that I love you all. And if you enjoyed the video, please do hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Do all that beautiful stuff. I apologize if this was not the top quality that you guys expect from me like normal. I know I sounded pretty much the same as always. Um... 
dealing with some bronch, 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 that's a fun word, bronch, uh, bronchial issues, bronchitis specifically, uh, and I kind of feel like crap. So that said, I refuse to n stop doing content. I refuse to pause. I refuse to relax. I will do this forever. Yeah. Anyways, my beautiful friends, I hope you have a beautiful day. Okay. I hope you have a great day, and I hope I'll see you on the next video. But until then, sleep well.